All right, so here we are. It's 2021, and we have great expectations and anticipate that we're going to turn the corner. And I think a lot of us were secretly hoping that 2021 was going to be a reset. Like, okay, 2020 didn't matter. And every other year since the beginning of, like, time, years have just kind of blended into one another. There's really not a big difference between, like, December 31st and January 1. But we were kind of, like, secretly hoping and praying that everything would just kind of, bloop, go away. And every, all this stuff would go away, and we'd kind of get back to normal. And here we are, and we're still kind of in the same spot we were in, and we don't know what normal's going to look like, and maybe there's going to be a new normal. And so, like, we went into 2021 like, ah! And we're kind of right now going, ah, yeah, that's just kind of like it was. But nonetheless, with 2021 and with a new year, there's, I think, in a way, still new hopes and new expectations, and there are still resolutions, and we're still going to do better in these different areas, and we're going to adjust. We, we kind of are used to this stuff by now. We're going to do better with it in the following year. But here's what I know about like just kind of going through the years and trying to make things better or be better or whatever. And for me, here's where I kind of get to a place of. I kind of get to a place where I'm like, I'm kind of overwhelmed a little bit with all the stuff that's going on, with all the people that need help. And I don't get overwhelmed easy. And I'm not like up at night like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? And I'm not, you know, stressed to the point where I'm sweating drops of blood like Jesus did in the garden yet. But here's what I notice when I turn on the news, which I try not to do very often, to be honest with you. When I'm on Facebook, I just see a lot of hurting people. And I think we're more aware of what's going on because there's more information going around. And so, like, a hundred years ago, let's say, hypothetically, you didn't know what was going on in different communities all across our nation. Now you do, because some of, somebody on your Facebook feed, like, some of your friends are connected to this person, and you hear about this story, and, you know, this, this four-year-old, this has happened, or this has happened to somebody's grandpa, or, like, I think about, like, Asa Newell, who's close to our hometown, and, and, you know, he's got cancer, he's a senior in high school, I'm like, man, where would I be if I was in that position, and, like, we've been praying for them, and I hope you pray for them, and I hope you get updates on them. But it's like, that story is not unique. They're just all over the place. And then you think about, like, worldwide, and the issues that are going on in the world. And even before there was a global pandemic, like, 27,000 kids a day die because of starvation. Just think about that for a moment. And there's like, you know, a fifth of the world's population, they don't have clean drinking water. And they get all kinds of bacteria and diseases because of the drinking water. It's like, just on and on the list can go. And you just look at that and you're like, man, as a Jesus follower, I'm like moved and I'm convicted to do something, but it's like, I got to do something. But man, there's so many somethings that I've got to do something about. And like, what am I supposed to do? And what ends up happening a lot of times, it's not that you, you become apathetic. You just kind of put your head in the sand and you just stop worrying about or being concerned with all the problems that are going on. You're just thankful that maybe that's not happening at your house or with your family or the people that you know and that you love, and you just try to keep your head down and keep doing what you're doing. And you're like, I, it's not that I don't want to help, it's just I don't even know where to start. You just kind of keep your head down and keep doing it. But we know as Jesus followers, that's not a good solution. Like, I can't help all these people, and I can't you know, change the world, so I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to kind of sit. And since I can't help everyone, I guess I'll help no one. There's a very famous phrase that I heard Andy Stanley say, and I think it originates with him. He says, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. You can't help everybody. You don't have the time, energy, and money to help everyone, but you can help one person. So do for one person, or do for one family, or do for one group, or do for one charity what you wish you could do for everyone. And who that one is is going to be different for you, like, some group is going to move your heart that may not move my heart as strongly as another group. So your one is different than my one, but that's the beauty of the body of Christ and the different passions and wirings that God has given to us. And the fact that you can't do something for everybody, you can't change the entire world, doesn't mean you shouldn't try to change the world for one person. So as we get into 2021, here's what I want us to get kind of refocused on and, and kind of get dialed in with. We need to renew our commitment to loving one, and to be about loving one. And we're going to cover a passage of scripture today. It's going to be Romans chapter 12. We're going to go verses 9 and following. So if you've got a Bible or your Bible app, I want you to open that. And we're going to walk through that passage fairly quickly. 
in the summer of this year, as I, as I was kind of prepping and praying for what, what 2021 was going to look like, this is the passage that kind of came into my mind and, and onto my heart, and so this is what we're going to be covering. But I covered this passage in detail during our summer series. Of course, we were all, I think, distance meeting then, but um, it was called It's Not About Me. So if you want a detailed explanation on Romans 12, 9 and following, you can get it there. So after we cover this passage, then we're going to remind ourselves, here's how we love one. There are four things that, not that I want to limit it to, but at least get us focused on. Here's how you love one. And these are the things that I want you to be doing throughout your next week and really throughout this entire year. But in the, as we jump into this passage, what the Apostle Paul does with Romans 12, 9, and this is, I want this to be our theme verse for the year. It's going to be our theme verse for our junior, senior, high group. It's going to be our theme for the adults and like, I want us to memorize this, and I want us to commit it to memory, and you're like, I, I memorizing scripture is something I did when I was like junior church, when I was a kid, and I was in Sunday school, like, aren't we past that? No, actually, the older you get, the more important the scripture becomes, because your problems get exponentially harder and more difficult, and scripture, it's not just something that we have that we just throw out there to impress people, it's something that hopefully lives inside of us that can challenge us, or equip us, or empower us to live the way that God wants us to live. So here's, and, and really I want us, it'd be great to memorize the entire passage, but let's just start with Romans 12, 9. Here's what Paul says. He says, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Love has got to be real, true, and genuine. And that type of love only comes from the Father and our connection with Him. So when he says the word love, that's the word agape, that's the selfless sacrificial, unconditional type of love. It isn't I love you because you can do something for me or I can get something from you. It's just I'm going to love you. and That's it. And that's the way that God loves humanity and this is the love that he wants us to show one another. So he says love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Maybe it brings to your mind 1 Corinthians 13. You know, the love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. doesn't boast. Eventually, Paul says... That love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. So here he says kind of the same concept a different way. You need to hate what is evil. Get rid of what is evil. Get it out of your life. Have no part in it. Things that are evil, things that are contrary to God's plan, though you may like them, and though you think you get enjoyment out of them. Paul says hate those things, because you cannot have those things in your life, and then Use those things to manipulate or hurt other people. Like, you got to hate what is evil, and you got to cling to what is good. You've got to hold on for dear life and never let go. And it's this beautiful picture of, as we kind of get into a passage, in your NIV Bibles, you maybe notice at the top, the, the uh, heading is love in action. And so what Paul does is he says, this is what love is supposed to look like. And I love the idea of love in action, because in 2021... We have to be about love in action. But let's say this together, okay? We're going to say it a couple times, and you may feel like this is kind of robotic, or I feel like I'm in a cult, Doug. Like, this is weird, man. Like, don't make me read and recite stuff, but just, just go with me on this, because this, like, if this becomes your battle cry, and the verses that follow get applied as well, like, 2021 is going to chalk up to be your best year yet. Not because you got the job or because COVID went away. Like, not because of the circumstances you found yourself in, but because you did what God wanted you to do more than you've ever done in your entire life. Okay? Let's read it together. Here we go. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Let's do it. Let's at least one more time. Here we go. Love must be sincere. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Like old school churches, they recite scripture, and you may think that's weird, but like the reciting of scripture, that's like one of the most biblical things we can do as a church and as Christians, and there's nothing that should navigate our lives like when we open up God's word and unpack it together. So as we think about what this looks like, Paul kind of gives us a picture. So in verse 10, he goes on to say, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. Now, as he gets into this, he's talking about us in the church and Christians. He's going to transition in a little bit to this is what it looks like outside of the church context. But inside the church context, we need to be devoted to one another in love, 
honor one another above yourselves. So I am going to take care of you and look to your interests and help you accomplish your dreams or whatever you're focused on. Like, I'm going to honor you above how I honor me. And you may think, that puts me in a vulnerable spot. Like, if I honor everyone else above honoring myself, then who's going to honor me? Everybody else is going to honor you. That's the picture of the church. So it's not just one person honoring me, like me honoring me, but it's like, you know, a hundred and whatever people honoring me. So if you're all honoring me above yourself, and I'm honoring all of you above myself, like that's what the church is supposed to look like. And it paints this picture of, like, it's not about me, it's about you and our connection to our Heavenly Father. And we need to be able to say, like, let go. We need to be able to say, this isn't about me, it's about you, and it's about my Father. So it's not about getting my wants and my preferences and my desires, it's about you. And if we could all say, this isn't about me. I don't come to church because it's about me. I come to church because it's about God, and I'm going to honor everyone else above myself. Like, that becomes a dangerous church in a good way. That becomes a powerful church. Because when everybody in the church says, it's not about me, it's about him, and it's about my brothers and sisters, that's a church that like, God uses to shake up the community and the county that they exist in. He goes on to say in verse 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And here's how you do that. You be joyful in hope, be patient in affliction, and be faithful in prayer. Be joyful in hope. That is to say, there is something that's going to happen at some point. We don't know when, but Jesus is going to come back. He's going to make everything right. We're going to spend forever in one of two places. You are joyful in the hope that we have that that's going to happen and that you get to spend forever with God. And because you're, you know, it doesn't matter what's happening in the here and now, you're joyful because of what's going to happen. And because you're joyful in what's going to happen, even though the thing's happening here, that's the patient and affliction part. Even though there are things happening here that you would not put in your script, or like if you were going to write a movie about your life, you would delete that scene. There are things that happen in your life that are awful. But you're going to be patient in the affliction because of the joy that you have and the hope of what's coming later. And then you are faithful Through it all, in the good times and the bad times and every time in between, you are faithful in prayer. Now, prayer is a tool that we don't often use in our arsenal. Like, there are tools that I have in my toolbox I never do anything with. Prayer is a tool that we don't normally use as Christians. Outside of meals and bedtime. And I think we, we, as an American culture, have completely missed the power of prayer. And in a lot of ways, it's because we don't really need a whole lot from anybody, including God. And so we just kind of go throughout our day and do our things, and we forget that prayer is a way to connect with God, but it's a way that, you know, God ends up moving through prayers and doing big things. So, like, never be lacking in zeal and passion. Let your fire for Jesus burn white, hot. Let that positively impact the people around you. And in doing so, you're joyful in hope, you're patient in affliction, and you're faithful in prayer. And then in verse 13, he says, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. So share with the Lord's people who are in need within the context of church and ministry. And once again, like, we don't maybe necessarily do this well, and I'll talk about why in a little bit, but like, if you have a need, and I can meet the need, and you're my brother or sister in Christ, and you're a part of this fellowship, I need to do whatever I can to help you. And, and the, share with the Lord's people who are in need. That's talking about physical, financial needs. Like if you don't have shoes that fit for your kids, and I have you know, shoes that I can use, like I need to give you shoes, or I need to give you a meal, or you just had back surgery, and you can't do some things around your house and the different chores, like I need to be there. If there's nobody else there helping you, I need to be there to help you. Like, share with the Lord's people are in need. It's like, once again, honor one another above yourselves. And we would say, well, I don't have time to go help everybody. I'll do all this stuff. Well, you need to make time to share with the Lord's people who are in need. And part of being a part of a Christian community is empathy and experiencing things the way that they experience. He goes on to say in verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. When somebody's celebrating something, you celebrate with them. If I honor you above honoring myself, when something good happens in your life, it's like it's happening in my life as well. 
on the flip side, mourn with those who mourn. So when you're going through a difficult time and you're frustrated by something and like there's something that's got you angry or hurting, like I'm with you in that. And maybe I'm not trying to solve the problem because that's how I'm, I want to solve the problem. And maybe I just mourn with you as you mourn and I try to fix whatever it is that's going on. I try to fix it. Live in harmony with one another. I love this next line. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Don't be a pompous, arrogant jerk who just uses people to advance your own cause and your own desires and your own wishes. It's like, I'm only going to have a friendship or relationship with you because you can advance me in the company in this way or you can connect me with these people. It's like, I'm only going to hang out with people that can like, advance my cause as opposed to just loving people as they are and associating with people that would be considered by our status or by our culture like low, so to speak. Paul's like, don't create a hierarchy. Well, this person's more important than this one, and I'm not going to hang out with them. I'm going to find ways to connect. Paul's like, if they're a part of the fellowship, they're part of the body, like, you need to love all people and help all people regardless of what they may be able to give you back. And then he shifts into, now here's how you need to love in the context of outside the church. And he says in verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, Paul's got people that are angry at him all the time outside the church. And they throw him in prison and they whip him and they try to stone him to death. Like they do some pretty bad things. And Paul's like, I can't do it like because they are telling me. The only way we're going to stop is if you stop preaching Jesus. Paul's like, I'm not going to stop preaching Jesus, so there's going to be tension and conflict. So as far as it depends on you, if you can do something, then do it. But like Paul, in his situation, I'm not going to stop preaching Jesus in order to make somebody happy or let, have them let up. Well, in our context, it may not be something that like clear and cut and dry, but listen, if there's tension in a relationship, and you've said, I'm sorry, and you've done what you've tried to do, and there's still tension, and you don't know what to do about it, then maybe you've done, as far as it depends on you, everything you can do. And maybe there's not peace in a relationship, not because you're withholding it, but because they are. Well, you cannot get so super focused and hyper focused, and this, once again, is talking about those outside the church primarily. If somebody at work doesn't like you, what are you supposed to do about it? You can be nice, you can pray for them, you can do whatever, but if they don't like you, Sometimes they just don't like you. It could be for a weird reason. So as far as it depends on you. Now inside the church, remember that Jesus says things like, when you are withholding something, like if you have a grudge, or you have a problem with somebody, and you're about to offer your gift, like leave your gift, go be reconciled with your brother, then come offer your gift. Now once again, that is, like you may try to make things right, and they may go, I don't care, I don't like you. Okay, nothing I can do about it. But the thing I don't want us to do is to just always wipe our hands of situations and say, well, that's on them. They're dumb. They don't know what's going on, or they misread, or whatever. Do whatever you can to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. Part of that deals with the do not repay evil for evil, and getting back, or getting even, or getting ahead when someone's done something to you. We call that revenge. Verse 19, he says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. So if someone has wronged you and hurt you, listen, you can take the proper channels and the proper, like if somebody breaks in your house and steals stuff, and you're like, okay, well, God's going to deal with this. No, you can call the police and file a report and do whatever you need to do from a legal standpoint. He's not saying that you never seek what, is, like, what we would call justice or what is right. He is saying you do not take matters into your own hands and repay evil for evil, which is how we're wired, by the way. Because if you hurt me, I'm coming back at you with a little bit more force than what you came at me. And then it's just a, like a competition. In fact, we're not supposed to repay. God's supposed to repay. And here's what Paul says we're supposed to do on the contrary. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head and you're like, literally, can I heap burning coals on his head? Paul's like, no, figuratively, you're heaping burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
He's saying here that when you go above and beyond, when you try to be nice and gracious and loving towards someone who hates you, that maybe that action will be used by God to convict their hearts, to change their way of thinking so that they switch over and say, you know what, I'm in the wrong and they're convicted and things get better as opposed to worse. That's the way that we heap burning coals on a person's head. Now, this entire passage of love and action, it's got some, like, you know, and we went through it pretty quickly there. But if you start to, like, look at each of those, and you may not be in a situation where there's tension with somebody in your life and there's an issue or whatever it is. But the moment you find yourself in that spot, this becomes really, really important. And whenever there's somebody on the outside of the Christian faith, who you, you wouldn't consider a brother or sister in Christ, but they don't like you and they try to say things about you and gossip and all this stuff, like how are you going to respond? How are you going to do what is right in the eyes of everybody? And this is so, so important to living out Jesus and the tenets of the Christian faith that this passage entitled Love in Action gets applied to our lives. Now, as we walk throughout the rest of this message, I want to use kind of what we've talked about to bring in something we've been talking about for like the last three years, this idea of love one. So I see some people have t-shirts or sweatshirts on right now. I see some people have got their bracelets on and like whenever we wear these, it is a reminder, I need to love one. I can't love everybody on the planet because I don't have the time, energy, or money to help everyone or to love everyone, but I can love one person today. Or I can love one family, or I can help one organization. Who is my love one? And it's a reminder that in all moments, that I need to be patient and kind and honoring of people, even if they are a part of the church or not. Like, I need to treat people with the utmost respect because Jesus loves that person. No matter how big of a jerk they are, no matter how mean they are, Jesus loves that person more than you and I could ever imagine. So this bracelet hopefully serves as a reminder, like, I cannot be a jerk as much as I want to. And when you want to, at least take it off first, okay? Don't tarnish the power that is the bracelet or the t-shirt, whatever it is. But when we think about loving one, we try to narrow the application to four areas. And the, the narrowing isn't supposed to say it's only this, but to say, okay, love one, that's kind of a broad concept. What does that look like? Well, in part, it looks like these four things. And I thought, like, we could go around like, hey, how do we love one and see how many of you can get the four things? Because we've been talking about it for, like, three years or so. But I want to do that because I'm nervous that you guys wouldn't be able to get all four. And then I'd be like, I feel like a total failure as your pastor, Okay. But when we ask the question, how do we love one, four things should come to your mind. It isn't just these four, but these four are four that we want to focus on throughout 2021. Here's the first one. How do we love one? We know one. Part of loving one is knowing one and being known. This idea of community, or you, you could use small groups, you can use the idea of a Sunday school class, but it's the idea that I'm a part of a group. And we pray together, and we study God's word together, and we talk about issues that are in our lives, and, and they know me on a deeper level than most people in the church. And a lot of times, and this is like, just think about our church, we're not like a huge church, we've got three services though. So if you come to the 9, or you come to the 1030, or you come to the noon, there are people coming that you don't know, that you maybe haven't ever seen. And if you walked into one of the other services, you'd be like, I didn't know they went to our, who is that person? I'm telling you, that's okay. We have got a mindset oftentimes, like, I need to know every single person in the church. I need to know your name and your kids' names, and I need to know where you work. And, like, we want to know everybody. And we think of, like, knowing one as being with. Like, I need to know everybody. I say, I'm saying it's the opposite. You don't need to know everybody. In fact, if you knew everybody on a surface level, really, you don't know anybody. That's like knowing people on Facebook. You know things about them, but you don't really know them. Sometimes that's what we want. I'm saying no. It's not about depth, or width rather, it's about depth. You know a group or you know one on a deeper level. You, know, you can't know everybody in our church like you know your small group or your Sunday school class. But listen, you can have your one that you grow in relationship with. Or you can have your one group that you grow in relationship with. And that is more effective and I would say more biblical than just knowing surface level stuff. 
And we think about small groups, and small groups have been tough for every church in America since like March of 2020 because of that thing. Oh, COVID-19, that's it, yeah. It's been really hard to meet. And like some classes are starting up, some groups are trying to meet again. It's, it's just been tough, and I get it. But here's the thing we want to do as we roll in to 2021. We want to have like a recommitment to community and groups. Because we believe that people learn in three environments, and all three have to be present in the life of a Christian. You have your large group environment, here you are. You have your small group environment, you have your private environment, like your private disciplines, private prayer time, private Bible study, devotions, whatever you want to call it. you got to have all three. The extroverts kind of ignore the private stuff and love being in small groups, and they love being in this environment. The introverts actually get away in this environment well because nobody knows and like if you get in and out late and leave early like people don't mess with you talk with you introverts do well here and they do well in the private but they do not do well in the idea of community or small groups but all three have got to be present but here's what i've noticed about groups just throughout my entire life and how like small groups in church have always kind of left me going i feel like there needs to be a little more because where I have experienced community the most and on its like strongest level has not been in church small groups. It's been on sports teams. That's when I feel community at its best. Now, to be fair, when you are on a basketball team, and I'll just use basketball only because it's the best sport out there. When you're on a basketball team, and it could be any others, but you're at practice every day for like two hours a day. And when you're not at practice, you're on a bus going to a game somewhere. And you have got a common goal and a common mission. And you've got your leader. He's your coach. And he lays things out. And it's, it's, it's so interesting because the bond that you share as teammates is unlike any bond that I've ever experienced. And once again, there's a lot more time on a sports team than there is, you know, if you're meeting once a week in Sunday school. I get that. But there's just so much I think we can learn from the area of sports. And it's, it's things like, you know, my teammates. I didn't like all my teammates. I knew that they had issues and, you know, like, they were imperfect just as I was. But when you walked out on that court and you had that Woodlawn jersey on, I don't care how much he annoyed me on the bus ride there. He's my brother. And we're going to war together. Like, that's the, that's the thought you had. And somebody starts getting chippy, and a lot of my, some of my teammates, they would get kind of, they'd start talking trash, and they would start writing checks that they couldn't cash on the basketball court, and here I am watching, and I'm like, oh my goodness. But you know what, you don't say anything to him. That's my brother. And like with my brother, I would, I'd beat him up every day, but you don't get to beat him up, he's my brother. I've earned that right, you didn't. So on the court, I may not like this guy in the classroom, and he may annoy me on the bus or in the locker room 10 minutes before, but you're not going to mess with him. That's my brother. Like there was a, this bond that you had was unlike anything else. And it was like, we were going to go to war, and we had a common goal. And here's the thing, and I am unashamed to admit to you, that like once I got into high school, every year after that, when a basketball season would end, and it usually ended on a, on a low note. Like, I never won a state championship. So all of my careers, they ended with a loss. And I cried like a little baby every single last game. Because something was ending. I have never in a small, like, okay, you, you're moving out of this Sunday school and you're now older, so you're going to go to this one. Ah, I never did that. Never did. Now I get it. Once again, it's different. But man, there's just something there. In fact, Last year, as the assistant coach, I like had to sit in a corner away from people because like I don't want to see I don't want these kids to see me bawling like a little girl after this last game, and I would have cried even harder had I known we weren't even going to really have a season this year. My tears would have been like you know even bigger in the boohoo. But like, there's just something about it that brotherhood, that fellowship, and the other thing too is like. On a basketball court, you could be so truthful with one another. We're not, we're not like tiptoeing around. It's, I would never go to one of my teammates and like, I, okay, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but 
you're, you're not doing this right. I'd be like, hey, and I'd grab him by the jersey. I'd get in his face. Well, this, this, you better get this cleaned up. I'm going to get you out of this game. Come on now. You can do better than this. We can do better. One of my teammates in college, he was getting up before the game, and he was like 6'8". He was my college roommate, and they had a low ceiling. And so he came into this area, and he's like, yeah, and he hit his head. And like the first three plays, he's doing something completely different. And I got a hold of him, and I said, if you don't get this figured out, I'm telling coach you hit your head, and you will never play another minute for the rest of the Like, I was so mad. Like, you can do that, because we're at war. We don't have time for me to go, okay, let me tell you three things that I really like about you, and then I'm going to tell you one that you need to clean up. Like, that just didn't happen. It was like, come on! Well, here's the thing about small groups. It tends to be more feeling-focused, and we're going to talk about things, and as a guy, it's like, I just don't connect with this. Like, I just don't feel inspired by this. I read a book. You're like, good for you. We're glad that you, we didn't know if you could read, but we're really glad that you read a book. Good, good Doug. That didn't come out right. It's a book that I fundamentally disagree with the, most, the majority of it. It was written by an atheist. But there, was, there were some parts that just got me thinking about church and ministry, and I'm like, there is something to this, even though I think the guy is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs in all these areas. The book's called Tribe. What the author does is he looks at how modern societies and conveniences has called, it's caused us to be more reclusive as individuals and as families. We don't need other people hardly at all. In fact, if you, if you need to get groceries today, you can pull up an app on your phone, have a pickup order ready to go with like two hours, pull into a parking lot, someone puts groceries into your trunk, and then they wave as you drive away. Like You can remove all interaction with people if you want to. You could Amazon Prime everything to your front door. And he says all of this reclusiveness is causing issues. In fact, one of the examples that he gives is in London during World War II. The Germans are flying, flying over and they're just bombing the snot out of London. And all of the doctors and physicians, they're worried about the, the morale and the psyche of the citizens of the city. Are they going to start tearing each other apart? Is this going to cause too much stress? And are people like, what's depression going to do? Like, what, what is this going to do to our people? And what they found, and nobody saw it coming, it's like every day, every other day, there'd be bombs dropping, and they had bomb shelters that they built. The morale of the citizens went up, and depression went down. In fact, all of the, all the residents of long-term mental care facilities, the attendance or the enrollment, I don't know the term, it went down. Like people just started miraculously getting better as you hear planes flying over and bombs being dropped all over your city. And they were like, what in the world could possibly contribute to that? And here's something that the author has pointed out, and I think he's on to something. He says this book is about why that sentiment, the idea of tribes and getting together, is such a rare and precious thing in modern society and how the lack of it has affected us all. It's about what we can learn from tribal societies about loyalty and belonging an eternal human quest for meaning. It's about why for many people, war feels better than peace and hardship can turn out to be a great blessing and disasters are sometimes remembered more fondly than weddings or tropical vacations. Humans don't mind hardships. In fact, they thrive in them. What they mind is not feeling necessary and living in obscurity and apathy. Modern society has perfected the art of making people not feel necessary. And it's time for that to end. So what I think about when I think about groups is this, this word tribe. We're going we're gonna to start calling our small groups ministry tribe. We're going to rebrand everything. And you may be like, Doug, I'm going to be honest with you, man, that's a little weird. Like, are you going to announce tribe some week and we're like an Indian thing? And like, what are you doing? With tribe, what's wrong with small groups? Because tribe communicates something different. And here's what it communicates, is that we're at war right now. It is a spiritual warfare. We fight on a spiritual battlefield. And there is too much at stake. Like your families are being attacked. 
you may not even realize it. And if you don't realize it, that's even more dangerous. But the enemy is going around trying to pick us off like a sniper. And he's trying to ruin your life through your kids or through your friends or through your family. Like, we are at war. And the way that we fight this battle is by banding together in tribes and saying we are not settling for mediocre. Like, if, if I were to tell you, like, what, what do I want to do more than anything else? I want to be a great husband. I want to be a great father. I want to be a great pastor. I want to be a great coach. Not X's and O's, but, like, I want to, like, relate to kids and give them a positive example. Like, those are the things I want to do. Well, how, did that, how does that happen? Not by accident. I'm not going to wake up one day and be more patient and loving to my kids and be more sacrificial in the way that I, I help take care of the needs of my family or, or what my wife's got going on. Like, it just doesn't happen by accident. How do you think it happens? Through hard work and accountability. Like, when I was, you know, like, if, if you say, hey, you got to do a workout today, and my least favorite workout is leg day. Oh, I hate leg day. I've always hated leg day. Because after leg day, I felt like I couldn't walk. It's like, you know, when you jump on a trampoline, and then you get off, and you're like, you felt like you couldn't get off the ground. And then, like, I was supposed to go shoot around. I feel like that. And how am I supposed to do these drills and these moves? I, I can't even move my legs. But you know the best workout day for an athlete? And it really doesn't matter the sport. Maybe ping pong is an exception, but I don't know that for sure. It's leg day. Leg day, core day. The things I love, like, you know, bicep curls and chest, doesn't really translate. The sports, the things that I hated the most are the things that benefited me the most. So as I kind of talk about tribe and saying, I don't want to be mediocre, I don't want to plateau, I don't want to be okay with status quo, like I'm at war and I'm going to get better. And I want to know who's with me. And you may, you may, some of you may go, I, you know what, that kind of, yeah, I don't want to sit around and sing kumbaya. I want to like, hey, let's do this thing. And some of you may be like, ah, that didn't sound good at all. I don't like the idea that we're going to war. I don't like that you're calling them tribes. And this whole thing weirds me out. Listen, if it does, it's probably going to be the best thing for you. It's probably the thing that you need the most. Because oftentimes we grow in moments of pain and discomfort as opposed to moments of like, comfort and doing what you want to do. Choose pain now to do what you don't want to do, to grow as a parent, as a husband, as a, you know, whatever, as a Christian Choose that pain now to produce growth so that when the real pain comes, you are prepared to withstand it. That's what tribes are all about. More details to follow. You're like, okay. And you may be secretly hoping. I hope this is one of those things that the pastor talks about and like three months later, it never, nothing comes of it and then we can just like keep going on as normal. It's not going to happen that way. I've already got my tribe tattoo. I am ready to go. Okay. So that's one way we love one, we know one. Another way is we pray for one. Man, I mentioned before, we don't pray enough. We don't pray because we think we've got it all figured out. We don't pray because we don't think we have needs. Prayer is the biggest and best thing that we can do. We need to be praying more than mealtimes and bedtime. We need to be like just pouring out prayers for every person that you can think of, for the church. For like, Just pray, 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 pray. Pray as much as you can and as often as you can, but have your, I'm going to pray for this family, this organization, I'm going to pray for this church, and you can't, like if you try to pray for everything in one day, you can't. You can pray for one thing, and just because you can't pray for everything, that shouldn't keep you from praying for one. We also love one by serving one. So through time, through energy, through money, we help to take care of people, we help meet the needs of organizations. Once again, you can't help everybody. But you can help one person today. You can help one person next week. Who is your serve one? And then finally, we love one by inviting one. Inviting one into a relationship with Jesus. Inviting one um, to church. Whatever that looks like. And I've said before, and I, man, I stand by it, that the people that are in your life, your family members, your coworkers, the people that you do life with that you see regularly, Nobody is better suited to invite them to church or into a relationship with Jesus than you are. And like you may look at me and say, well, Doug knows more about the Bible than I do. I may not. I may be able to articulate it better than you can. I may be able to answer more questions that they have. But that does not mean 
that I can have a better influence on their lives and have a better chance of bringing them to Jesus. Like, when they love you, when they know you, when they have a relationship with you, you have leverage in their lives that I do not have. You're their best friend or you're their coworker or whatever. I'm just some random pastor coming up to them, and I'm going to sound like every other random pastor that they listen to. They don't know me. They don't trust me. None of it. But you are different. And as we go through all these loved ones, there is nothing bigger or more significant than impacting someone's eternity. When God uses you to bring someone into a relationship with Him, and where they spend forever changes, nothing bigger than that. And getting to know people, I think that's so important because we're at war. So the, the idea of your tribe, that's going to be so important moving forward. Prayer is so important. Serving people, helping people is so important. But this, this impacts forever. And we need to move past, I don't know enough, or I'm shy, or I don't know what to say. Like, we have got to get over the excuses, because time is ticking down, and we don't have time to waste. So as we end today, let me ask you a question. Who will you help change the world for in 2021? You can't change the world. You can change the world for one person. Who is that going to be? How is God going to use you to impact the people, the families, the individuals in your life? How is he going to use you to change their lives? Too often, we just sit on the sidelines. We just let things happen. We just let them play out. And we don't involve ourselves or engage and we don't jump in the game it's like christianity for us is very much about observation it's a spectator sport so we watch everybody else and, and you may even pray for the people that are doing things but you just kind of see yourself as support and not in the game but like you got to understand that god has put you in people's lives so you can change the world for them so you can't make excuses no more sitting on the sidelines now is the time to do the things that God wants you to do and to live the way he wants you to live and impact the people he wants you to impact. If we get this right, if we get this right, we start impacting people positively in the name of Jesus and then they start impacting people positively in the name of Jesus, man, there's no limit to what God will do through us and through our church. So don't just be like, okay, well, that was interesting. The tribe thing was a little weird. Where do you want to go to lunch? Don't leave here like that today. Leave here saying, how are we going to make 2021 our best year yet? Because whether or not it's going to be a great year is completely dependent on us. I don't care if COVID stays or goes away. I don't care if there's a new strand of something. I don't care if the vaccine is successful or it fails. Like, I'm not worried about any of that stuff. I'm worried about this and building his kingdom and his righteousness. And I hope that what consumes your heart and your thoughts and what goes on in your mind is this as well.